Let's go. Hi, Pam. Hi. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm fine. That's good. Uh, cool. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Pam Butler. I'm an artist. I make paintings. I print, and I print things. Yeah. A magazine. Um, I make Xerox books. I uh, published a book from a street art project I did. I. I do drawings, lots of drawings, mm -hmm. and I take lots of pictures. Cool. And when did you start publishing your own uh, books? So I, I, when I did, I did this street art project in the 90s, and uh, I did it for two years intensely. That's about all I did as mm -hmm. an artist. And um, when I finished it, I decided I wanted to make it into a book because I felt that it spoke in a particular way on the street, and I could speak a different way and do different things with it as a book. And I started to put it together and I did some residencies and I worked on it. And then I started to talk to people in publishing. I realized I had laid it out wrong. I hadn't, I hadn't taken into account that I needed to figure out all kinds of things about printing before I did it, et cetera, et cetera. And I got really discouraged and I put it on the shelf and I'd occasionally pick it out and pick at it. And technology began to change. Mm -hmm and more and more and and so finally I learned how to do Quark and I worked on it for a while and then I got distracted and then Quark as a program disappeared mm -hmm. and so I had to learn InDesign. <laughs> and do and, it all over and again. And then I, well, <laughs> you, I didn't have to completely do it all over again because mm. I had all the files but I had to reload the files into a new program and mm. there were differences but I figured it all out and it was fine and I decided I had to get it finished before InDesign disappeared. <laughs> Yeah. And before I spent the money I'd saved to do it. So I, well, I actually, at first I, I had a publisher um, and I was really excited and it was a really good publishing house, a very small uh, literary publishing house. And then it was 2009 and money was really tight mm -hmm. and they were barely hanging on and they don't do many art books. And it was pretty clear that our visions were different and although... I had the contract and was about to sign it. They decided they just couldn't afford to do it. And so you decided to publish it well, yourself? Well, I decided to publish it myself then, partly because in that experience I realized their vision was really different than mine. Mm -hmm. And if I had gone with them, I wouldn't have had the book I wanted. Mm -hmm. So that's this book. So that's this book here, the Good Girl book. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and uh, the posters, the street art project, are, are, are posters that look like this. Yeah. So there's, so the good girl, whoops, hold them up so you can see them. I don't know if I have any grays in. Mm. Oh, you have two grays in here, sorry. <laughs> nice. Some of them didn't have words. Most of them have words. And so what is this project about? So, and there were guys in it and stuff. Let me see if I can. So this is how it would look on the street. Mm -hmm. Good boy, uh, Prince Charming. Um, the project was really about... Uh, uh, it was about how we use stereotypes to form our identity mm -hmm. and to talk about each other. So, so that, in, in, so the inspiration was uh, sitting in a, um, a meeting of a feminist group and hearing the women talk through these stereotypes that really upset me because I didn't feel like they were seeing them. And, and it really, and I was just like, why are they behaving like that? And uh, I'd done a little bit of street postering for shows I was in and stuff. Um, you know, New York was a, a wash in street posters at that time. And I just went home and I drew it. And, and I had been also been playing with words and images uh, around the idea of, of the identity of it. And so it just grew. And over the course of the two years, um, you know, at first it started with the um, desire and the thwarting of the desire within the stereotype. So there were a lot of words like will, want, and 
conversely with good girl, nice, slut, whore. So there was this mixing of these terms. And then there was the mixing of in of things like, suppose I was a princess. So the sort of fantasy level. Um, but the arch over arch was that we apply these stereotypes, we apply these myths to ourselves and to others without any investigation and that they kind of bubble up through the culture. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're like these, um, the, it's an undercurrent of myth that tells us who we are and it generally goes uninvestigated. Mm -hmm. So that point was to investigate it. And that's sort of in everything I do as an artist, even if it's not a particularly straightforward female identity thing, has to do with that in one way or another. So that's what this project was about. Perfect. Um, I was about to ask you why do you, do you publish like this, but maybe you already answered a bit. Uh, can, yeah. Can you? Uh... So so I so I did this book and I fell in love with um, making these this, this mm -hmm. stuff happen and. Mm -hmm. But I, I kind of put it aside because it was really expensive to do this whole book, um, and I, you know, I, and uh, you know, it's, art books don't sell a whole lot. They sell yeah. <laughs> not any better than poetry books, if as well as poetry books. Um, but then I had an opportunity to work in this uh, workshop that Printed Matter set up, and I made this Riso, okay, and um, Xerox book. So it's a Riso and Xerox. Some pages are Riso and Xerox together. Like this one is a Riso and Xerox together. Mm -hmm. uh, and while I was working there, I talked to um, different people involved in mm -hmm. different ways of publishing. And they told me about a website where I could do magazines. Okay. And I thought, that sounds like fun. I can make my own magazine. <laughs> I'm going to make my own magazine. So I made my own magazine. Mm -hmm. And that is Lotion. Mm -hmm. Why Lotion? Uh, because I... It's called Lotion because I made out a... I went through words after words after words. I narrowed it. And, and I was just making lists of words. And there was a thing of hand lotion on my desk. <laughs> There still is. Um, and so lotion went onto the list of words, and then I took off most of the ones I didn't like, and I read it to a friend, and he said, lotion's the only one that works. And I thought, that's a good okay, one. it's a good one. It's a good one, it'll do. So that's why it's called lotion. Okay. Um, and then I looked it up and made sure there were no other magazines called lotion mm -hmm. or zines, and there weren't, mm -hmm. so I took it. So the I for the first one, I, I and so I've, I've taken different themes for each one. The first one has to do with um, work I did in the last decade, not this decade. Well, I've, actually, I've gone back to it a little bit. Um, going to pageants, uh, beauty pageants. I went to two Miss America pageants and a Miss New York State pageant. And, and then I collage, so there's this. And I also pulled images off of line so that there's this. So this is... Um, photograph of mine that has nothing to do with pageants. This is a photograph of mine from a pageant. This is pulled off of line. And this is a photograph that has nothing to do with pageants. Mm -hmm. And But I collage them sort of still with the same idea mm -hmm. of how we have all these different ideas that, that form who we are. Like mm -hmm. we're not, I mean, that's what I love about collage. And the magazine offers me the collage because I can go from her to this. Yeah. And then it leaves the question, her to this. So is there an intention in this magazine to, um, to tell a story? To I don't, I, I think of them more as poetry. Mm -hmm. So there's not a non-narrative. Mm -hmm. But there is a starting point, there is an idea. So in this one, the idea was trying to pull out a certain feeling tone or sense of reality, of, uh, no, of, of psychological place, mm -hmm. with pulling it from the pageant photos and mixing it with other photos. 
So there's sort of a, um, I can't think of the word. Um, oh, I'm terrible with words, I really am. Otherwise I'd be a poet. Um, like. But um, so pathos, pathos. Mm -hmm. There's sort of a pathos that I'm looking at mm -hmm. of the way in which a particular way of being infects the broader culture and the people involved in that particular mm -hmm. thing. So it's not just um, the pageants themselves, but it's the way in which they relate to the overall culture and and sort of their underlying pathos, their underlying mm -hmm. you know, the sort of sadness in it. And also the, the constant need as an individual to, to be something, mm -hmm. to have an identity. There was a while where I mixed the beauty pageant imagery with and I still do sometimes, and the female imagery with um, sort of these wallpaper patterns I've made out of the remains of suicide bombs I've pulled off of line. And the idea is that like, they're both reaching for the same thing. They're reaching for a, trans, a transcendence, a, a certain a way in which they stand out and become more than who they are mm. as part of the crowd. Mm -hmm. So if you're win at a beauty pageant, you become the winner within your culture, because there is a particular culture for pageants. If you are a suicide bomber, you have reached the highest level within that particular... Mm -hmm. And is this why you make art, to, to stand out? Yeah, I think there is a part of that mm -hmm. in art making. I think that's true mm -hmm. for all artists. Mm, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. So it's, it's also then becomes my own struggle to stand out, looking mm -hmm. at other people and looking at the ways in which mm -hmm. there's a path that's but, but in the examples that you took, there, there's something um, that is almost uh, ridiculous, uh, uh, that is um, uh, an exaggeration of, uh, of this yeah. um, will to stand out. And uh, um, is, is your art um, close to that kind of exaggeration? Uh, um, well, if I think of like the real exaggeration, I think of someone like Salvador Dali. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he's a really good exaggeration. Um, if I think of somebody, an artist who stands out and worked to stand out, but did it in a quiet way, I would think of Duchamp, perhaps, because um, mm -hmm. he was a showman, but not a noisy showman. He was very uh, yeah quiet. Yeah, for years and years he yeah. wasn't. You know, and, around and doing yeah, any, he, uh, any work and. Well, he was not, doing. Actually, he did a lot of work. The yes, yes. That he didn't do any work. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> he was retired from the public. Uh, public. Uh, but, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Although he did make money from multiples. Mm -hmm. He did make a lot of multiples. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I think you know, I think of um, you know, but Duchamp worked really hard to become a professional chess player mm -hmm. and only left it when he realized he would never be as good a chess player as he was an artist. Mm. So there is that sort of drive to stand out. And I think we all have that drive to stand of course. out. Of course. Uh, some of us just have not have the need, mm -hmm. I think, from other unfulfilled needs to do it more than others. Mm. Can you show the... Uh, this one? No, the little Xerox one. The little Xerox. So I've also... Someone gave me this wonderful Xerox machine that's right next to the camera, <laughs> which I had wanted for ages. I had had one briefly, and then it fell apart on me. But this one I knew was in really good shape, because I knew who had it. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't give it up. And finally, they were moving. Mm. And they decided they would get... It was an office, and they would get a real, like, modern copy or digital mm. copier, and they gave it to me. And it does really beautiful things. It makes um, it doesn't show as much in here. Well, it, but you know, I have all kinds of controls over. So this is I am very beautiful, which takes uh, different found images. Words that I've used, I am very, I've used um, affirmations a lot in my work. So this is this. This is a self portrait of me in my Halloween costume one year. It's, it's in 
<laughs> just behind you. Yeah. Um, I swear I wasn't drunk. I was not drunk when that picture was taken. <laughs> so, and I did a bunch of paintings from this found image. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit, um, you were telling me before uh, about when you arrived in New York and um, your personal history. Can you tell us about, you know, what's the relationship between the history of Pat Butler and the, the zines and the artworks that you're making now? The story of Pam Butler is not always a pretty story. Uh, Pam Butler was a uh, did not do well as an adolescent. She mm -hmm. was um, a dropout, um, a, uh, I hung out with the wrong crowd and I did the wrong things. Um, and misbehaved greatly, ran away from home a lot. Um, in school, I had been ostracized by my peers. Mm -hmm. I was picked on. I was, um, I was in fact subjected to a lot of these stereotypes that I used mm -hmm. um, when I was really young. So it was really, um, I think as I get older, I realize it affected me a lot more than I gave it credit mm -hmm. for when I was younger. Uh, but I also didn't have a great relationship with my parents, so things really stuck. Um, and, but I sort of used, I, I, I uh, found art in my late teens. I hadn't really, I'd just been, I wrote a lot and been sort of at loose ends, but I found art in my late teens, found that I loved it, mm -hmm. found that it was an escape uh, that was much better than drugs and alcohol, even mm -hmm. though I kept using <laughs> a lot of drugs and alcohol. Um, and I eventually, uh, went through school and I got a little bit of attention for my work when I was done with school, um, but I was kind of, I was still acting pretty wild and hanging out with not very good people, like drug dealers and stuff like that. And uh, so nothing really happened with that. Mm -hmm. And um, I eventually cleaned my act up because I was really bored with living that way, mm -hmm. finally. Uh, and went back to school and got a master's degree. And shortly, it was the influence of um, a couple of things that Judy Pfaff said to me in my studio that led me on the path to what I'm doing now. And it was just some comments, some offhand comments on some sketches in the corner that were very different than what I had been doing. And I just kind of, it, gave me an opening to explore those sketches and what they were, and it just kind of grew and grew from there. Mm -hmm. And so would you say that this work that you're doing uh, about stereotypes, is it something that you're doing for you to deal with your personal history, or is it something that you do for others uh, so that they can relate to, to, to that is history and maybe find themselves in, in this? Uh... I never uh, thought about it that directly. Um, I think every artist is dealing with their own personal history in their work. Mm -hmm. Some are more explicit than others. Uh, if you're working in abstraction, there is less direct relationship mm -hmm. to your personal history, perhaps. But it is always, it is always only your story that you can bring to the world, because mm -hmm. that's what all you really know is mm -hmm. your story. Um, I think really what, if I'm saying like what of myself if I'm, am I bringing to the work, part of it is just my frustration that people don't, even myself, you know, so it's not, it's not just like you guys don't see, it's like me too how little we understand where our understanding of the world and each other comes from. Mm -hmm. And how little we know about how that works. Like I just said, like I, I didn't know when I was younger how much the, the stuff in, when I was really a young mm -hmm. teen affected me. 
because it wasn't part of my understanding of the world. I, I didn't have the perspective I have when I'm older, uh, nor had I investigated it enough. It was just, you know, it's just like whatever, life happens. Um, those guys were all losers anyway. I wanted out. I wanted out of the suburban, <laughs> sub, yeah. suburbia anyhow. Um, you know, small town American suburbia. Um, so I think it's a lot of just, uh, you know, when when we went into Iraq, um, I started painting pictures from of war casualties, which in fact, because the press was so tightly controlled, were hard to find even on the web. Uh, there were some really, I had to go through layers to get the really graphic imagery, which some of which I've never really quite been able to use. But the other reason I didn't do it was I felt like there's a way in which I'm prettified, making it too uh, aestheticized. Mm -hmm. I'm aestheticizing mm -hmm. more. And that, no matter how horrifying the pictures were, they were also aestheticizing. But it was still that same idea. Like, I wanted to bring out what wasn't being discussed. Mm -hmm. I was really upset. So for a period of time, around the, like three or four years around that, the beginning of that war, and that's when I started working with the suicide bomber wallpaper, mm -hmm. um, I was interested in, uh, like, why it why we allowed ourselves to get talked into that war and I started working with astronauts because I saw this conception that had grown up in the mid-century from you know our winning you know the grand victory of the Second World War or, you know the self-righteous victory in the Second World War and that's the story we tell ourselves so that's the myth and then you know the benevolent night of conquering the moon the sort of, if you go to the Air and Space Museum, they show you all the way from medieval armor to a spacesuit. <laughs> and so you have this white spacesuit and this sort of scientist, uh, explorer, adventurer knight. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have this concept of our, ourselves as this good, victorious stained by the Vietnam War, so we're going to go conquer everything and mm -hmm. reclaim this virtuous night. And I really felt that that was very um, prominent in the thinking of that period, but that that had been, you know, George, the president was my generation, mm -hmm. and I knew that he had been caught in this myth, as, and, and he was not a very self-reflective person, mm -hmm. um, and the people around him were caught in this myth. And, so is the country. Okay. And just to finish, um, what is the best, the most important thing for you in, in your work? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> or what haven't we talked about that is important to you? Um, the most important thing to me is when I feel like I have shown someone something they didn't already know. When I was doing the street posters, the Daily News did this little piece about, inf you know, influential people in New York. And I was in that, and they put like a line or two for each person, and I was in that. And what they said was, she makes people think as they walk down the street, and that's the best thing anybody could say about me or my work. Perfect.